Today I'm interviewing Margaret Grigg, Deputy CEO at Mind Australia. Margaret, tell me about what Mind does. Mind Australia is a specialist mental health community managed organisation. Effectively we work with people with mental health issues to identify what's important to them and to think about how they might live the life they want to live, uh, work towards their goals and achieve their dreams and aspirations. That's an admirable plan for your organisation. Tell me what does a typical client look like? Mind. Look, it's really difficult to talk about what a typical client looks like. You know, they really reflect the diversity of people that we see in our community. So we might, we might work with young people who've got kind of faced a range of challenges, perhaps um, are, are facing a series of mental health issues, but may have, maybe have never seen a doctor. They don't have any diagnosis or illness. At the other end of the spectrum, we might work with people who have had really significant problems, spent lots of time in hospitals, um, spent lots of time in services. Indeed, today I was just reading the story from, from one person who had spent three and a half years in a, in a, a clinical service in one of their long-term community care units who came over to one of our shorter-term residential services. And, and the letter that she wrote uh, was about what it was like to be in a place where she could begin to think about what she wanted and what was important to her and what, what sh life she wanted to leave, lead rather than to think about her illness and what treatment people were giving her and, um, and uh, it, was, it was really touching and I think that it, it talks to, it really does talk to the value of really being able to focus on the strengths of people, to really focus on the hopes and aspirations that we all have and to focus a little bit less on the illnesses or the problems or the limitations that people face. So it's a rewarding place to work? Look, it is a really, really rewarding place to work. We work with, um, we work with a fantastic team across the organisation um, and the work that we do I think for many people makes a really big difference in the lives that they lead. So tell me how do you help those clients to connect with other services in the community and with those things that they need to make their lives what they want? So there's a whole range of ways in which we might do it. Um, there are some really formal service models and Partners in Recovery is one of those and, and one of those services that we provide in partnership with you where what we understand for people who have quite a lot of needs is that you know they go over to the housing provider and they have their GP and they're off at Centrelink and they're perhaps seeing lots of services but those services aren't working with people in a consistent and coordinated way and so Partners in Recovery have been a, is a fantastic program that actually brings people together with the person so we can all work together to achieve what they're looking for. Again, in another way, um, a, 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 we may be merely telling people what might be available to them. People may have the resources themselves to access the services they need. They just don't know what it is. Or, or sometimes really importantly, just helping people think about what they want. It's, you know, it is a, it's a question we don't always think about when we say, well, what are you passionate about? Have you thought about, have you thought about going back to school? Have you thought about and can we help you think about what being a volunteer might look like? So some of it, some of it and a great deal of the work we do is really opening possibility up for people. So where do you find barriers in the system to achieving that for clients? Um, so I think that um, there are a range of barriers that people face. Many, many people face difficulties in finding the service they need at the time that they need it. And so I think that the complexity of services available for people, the fact that we often deliver services in silos, um, and that we leave people at their most vulnerable to figure out how to do that is a really, really significant um, barrier. Every service has its own criteria for getting in, and sometimes the labels you have to pick up or the process you have to pick up is just kind of really difficult for people. Um, many, many people really talk about having to spend quite a bit of time on finding those services. Then there's absolutely no doubt that many of the people we work, work with um, uh, uh, experience significant poverty and disadvantage, have faced trauma, and they become really added 
barriers to actually really being able to find the help and assistance. Just, you know, what it's like to live in poverty and to actually not even really able to be easily able to afford the bus fare to take them along to the service might exist, they might be happy to take them, but actually being able to afford to engage with it for very small amounts of money are really significant barriers um, for our clients finding the help and assistance that they need. How then can the system better respond to those needs? As you've said, there's, um, there's services there, there's people who need services, sometimes they can't get to them, sometimes there's access barriers around um, eligibility criteria, things like that. But how can the system work better together to respond to those needs of your clients? Um, I think that your comment about um, the system working together, I mean, there's, there's really no doubt that the broader uh, economic environment that we work in, within is challenging and many of our clients live in poverty. They have difficulty accessing affordable housing. Um, the employment rate in the community is going up and what we find is our clients are people who find it very difficult to compete for the few jobs that we have. So with an inability to really impact upon those bigger structural issues that I think are really, really important in how we think about that. Um, if I think about the services that we work together, I think that a lot more could be achieved if firstly we were able to work together much more effectively, um, that there was some consistency in the way in which we were able to take a person-centred approach. I think there's a lot that we do that's ineffective that we're just used to doing. Um, I, don't, I don't think that we listen enough to people about what's important um, and that government funding programs have sometimes responded to what's in favour with government rather than really listening or understanding what the evidence tells us about what's likely to be effective or listening to what people themselves say that they want. The primary health networks that are coming in to replace Medicare locals, one of their objectives is to provide the right care in the right place at the right time. It's a big objective, as you've already identified. What do you think the likelihood is that they can actually make a difference in their first couple of years of operation? Um, so, I actually have quite a deal of hope for the primary health networks. Um, uh, I, you know, the capacity to build off what I think that we've learnt through Medicare Locals is really important. So that the most effective Medicare Locals, from my perspective, have actually been very good at bringing providers together. Um, and a, providers who don't normally come together to think about, um, to think about how service delivery is delivered. So if I think about, if I think about services um, in, in what will be your PHM, um, we're just establishing the headspace in Greensboro. Um, that, was, that was very much an initiative led by local council, but the Medicare local in that region was really critical in helping the council think and understand how they could work together for similar objectives, but actually bringing along the other players that were needed. And so that when um, uh, when we put in the proposal for the headspace, um, we had something like 18, 19 organisations wanting to be partners within that headspace. And what I'll say is, for me, that was a that was real expression of the effectiveness of the Medicare local in bringing players together. I think that that opportunity for the PHM to really think about and uh, to think about the notion of itself in population health planning and to really think about how it's an enabler and a driver of service reform, probably really bringing um, the, the perhaps more traditional clinical and medically oriented services, both at the specialist and primary level, together into the broader community sector is an enormous opportunity for us to really to make pretty substantial improvements in the context of at least the service system that we have.